You're listening to the Visibly Fit Podcast. Hey, I'm your host, Wendy Pett, and every week I'll give you holistic, practical solutions for everyday issues related to nutrition, healing, functional fitness, and behavior modifications. As a naturopath, fitness expert, and wellness coach for over 20 years, my goal is to empower you to reach for greater health and to rise up to your next level of living in mind, body, and spirit. You were created with greatness in mind. It's time to own it. Are you with me? Then let's dive in. Hey there, and welcome to the Visibly Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Wendy Pett, and this podcast is part of the Spark Media Network, and it can be found on the Edify app, free.com, KHCB Upstream uh, uh, streaming, uh, uplifted streaming, excuse me, uplifted streaming, and so many more um, platforms. So wherever you are listening, we are just glad that you are here. You know, Ephesians 2.10 tells us, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So, so, and I underlined, so we can do the good works and good things he planned for us long ago. And this scripture verse really stood out to me today, especially for the guests that I have on this episode, because um, of how it starts out for we are God's masterpiece. And my guest coming up really talks a lot about this in her new book called Upcycled, Crafted for a Purpose. My guest on today's show is Tina Yeager, and she is an award-winning author, inspirational speaker, and life coach. Tina also hosts the Flourish Mint podcast and publishes Inspirations Online. It's a weekly devotional for writers, and she has won more than 30 writing awards, including a 2020 Golden Scroll Award and 2013 FCHC, excuse me, FCWC Writer of the Year. And I have read um, um, her upcycled book here, and it is amazing. And her writing is spectacular. I can see why she won awards. Her fiction and nonfiction strive to uh, clarify how we might relate better to others, to ourselves, and to God. She is a licensed, uh, licensed as a counselor and has been since 2005. And she has more than 20 years of experience teaching parenting to at-risk families writing skills, communications, inner healing, and spiritual growth. She has counseled and taught adults, teens, and children in academic, clinical, and faith-based settings. And Tina enjoys working with diverse populations and has practiced in community mental health settings and private practice since 2000. And she specializes in ADHD, um, stress management, purpose uh, definition, abuse recovery, and esteem building and currently runs an online life coaching practice, and it's called Divine Encouragement. And uh, Tina Yeager holds a BA in creative writing and an MA in counseling. Now, um, Yeager serves on the steering committee of Advanced Writers and Speakers Association as director of traditional groups with Word Weavers International and as an active member of the Christian Authors Network and Christian Women in Media Association, which is one of the places I've had the pleasure of getting to know Tina. Um, she has a couple courses out. Her course on subdue stress and anxiety and psyched characters and Kindle your creative spark are available online. So maybe you'll want to check that out here in just a little bit. We'll tell you how to get a hold of those. But uh, currently, as a life coach, author, speaker, and podcast host, Jaeger is also familiar with shame's oppression at a personal level. Tina wrestled with isolation from peers. She wrestled with body image and low self-esteem issues, even trending into eating disordered behavior. But the Lord sustained Tina, praise God, through a desert-like journey of character, transformation, training, and effort. And to learn more, you can find out uh, more about Tina at tinayeager.com. But welcome to Visibly Fit, Tina. I am so honored to have you. And it's been such a joy getting to know you over the last year or so through Spark Media Network and through Christian Women in Media. 
Thank you, Wendy. It's always delightful to be in your presence and have a conversation with you. Oh, you're so sweet. Well, I wanted to have you on. First of all, you've got this great new book out called Upcycled, Crafted for a Purpose. And when I first heard about it, I actually saw you do a craft on YouTube or Facebook or something. I can't remember. And so I thought the book was really just about crafting. And for me, I mean, I um, failed home ec and made an A in woodshop. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of one of those nailed it kind of people from Pinterest. It's like, oh, I, you know, I attempt it, but you look at it, it looks nothing like the craft I was supposed to do. And so when I first saw the book, I was like, oh, that's nice, but no, thank you. And then you sent me the book and I'm like, oh, this is what Upcycled is all about. And I love it because it is about crafting, but yet that's not really what it's about. It's about crafting your heart. Uh, to become more like Christ. And so you you have questions about doing some deep dive heart work and all that. Anyway, I'll let you explain the book. But um, I was so excited to read it and it blessed me so much. So tell us a little bit, um, I guess, first of all, before we even go there on the book, I'd like to know um, kind of your, your, um, your infatuation maybe with crafting and how this even came to about the thought of even writing this book came about? Well, I've always loved the easy crafting. I'm not a professional artist or anything like that, but I, I love the things that you can finish and they're done and they're beautiful. It's not like a book that's never, ever, ever, ever done. It's, it just seems like it goes on forever. <laughs> it's never done. So in between those things, I like that quick, let's just make some beaded jewelry or something that you just you really can just enjoy and you can't mess it up. So it's not for people who are professional artists necessarily. It's for people like you and I that kind of like doing artsy kinds of creative things that are fun, but they don't require perfection. So that's kind of my love for art. And I also have always loved looking at things that are made beautiful. I just, I love going through antique shops and seeing what other artists do, other forms of art. I think art inspires creativity and creativity connects us with our creator. And I think there's something neurological that's really healing and beneficial in creative work as well. 100%. And that is one of the reasons I was just um, enamored by your book, because I, as as you know, a practitioner and helping people heal through different uh, layers of, of trauma through, you know, well, different layers, but in the health and wellness space, but there's a lot of layers to that, as you know, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but um, we do some healing kind of artwork and different things uh, in my program. And so I just seen, you know, the tears flow, the aha moments happen, the hearts open whenever we do these kind of um, crafts or artwork and that kind of thing. And so there is great healing power when you are being creative and when you're crafting, when you're doing art. And um, one of the things that you said in your book, and, and I, I love this, it's art's value comes from the creator, not the materials. And so as a recovered perfectionist, I, I, I say recovered, maybe I'm recovering, but I like to think I'm recovered. Um, it's good to know that, yes, it's not the materials. It's not how the craft turns out. Um, art's value comes from our creator. And so since we are created in God's image, how we look at our craft, you know, that's what gives it value, not what other people think. So let's kind of talk a little bit about that and, and your uh, perspective on that. I love that we are not on our own of any real intrinsic value in our own strength, other than the fact that God created us. And if you look back at the beginning of creation, God took dust and scooped it together and breathed into it to make us. So really without him, we're just dust. And that is not a bad thing. It's not slandering us or anything like that, but it's saying that we have eternal value because the breath of God sculpted us, the word of God called us into existence, and the spirit of God seeks us and seeks to give us more and more value the more we grow into relationship with him. So that's that ongoing artwork and heart work that God does to make us as dusty, old, rusty, kind of feeling like we have no value people 
into things that are immeasurably value beyond all compare. So good. I love that. And you, um, you share so many different ways, um, analogies basically, um, of, of putting, you know, certain artwork or crafts with the, the craftsmanship of, of our heart and, and how we are, um, you know, if we see ourselves as maybe not, uh, worthy, maybe more like trash, like how God makes good from trash. I mean, you, you just really, uh, go into examples and, and talk about the brokenness and, uh, of people. And, and you use the analogy of, of, or even just the craft of doing mosaic, right. The broken pieces and how those broken pieces, when they come together, make a beautiful, um, piece of art. Um, one of the things that you talk about is, uh, in those, uh, in the mosaic um, chapter, you said an effective mosaic depends upon three key factors and it's elements, composition, and setting. And I thought that is so powerful because that is, um, that relates to us as humans too. Um, you know, not with the artwork, but the analogy of it, the elements of who we are, the composition and the setting. Let's dive deep on that and talk about how a broken person, broken people as community, how we come together and those three key factors um, make it so beautiful. Well, first of all, we're all flawed and broken people. So God chooses broken people because that's all he has to choose from other than Jesus. Right. We are all flawed. We all, we're all he's say. got. This is it, Lord. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So that's what he chooses. He chooses all flawed and broken people. Yeah. So if you're thinking you have to be perfect for him to choose or use you, then you must be mistaken because there's no one else for him to choose that's perfect. So he will use those of us who are broken in conjunction with other people that are broken, and we will fit together just as he's designed us to, just as he's designed us for his great kingdom masterpiece. The story of the kingdom of God is broken people that God restores by putting them into his story next to other broken people to tell that redemptive gospel message of God is good and God loves us and God redeems us into relationship with one another and with him. Mm, that's so good. And uh, part of that mosaic piece, you talked about, you know, the setting of that, of that mosaic, the only thing that would make it really stick and, and, and form into that uh, beautiful artwork that you have is a, is a particular type of setting. Um, and so God is the one who sets us in place and sets us and grounds us with that uh, solid foundation, right? Um, I, we're going into, if you're listening to this live, uh, live time, we are going into the Thanksgiving week. And so um, you may be around quite a few broken people this week. And, you know, you may be broken yourself. Like Tina said, we're all broken, but yet we are not broken because of Jesus. But I, I want to talk as a, you know, as a therapist, as a licensed counselor, um, you have worked with so many different families over the years. Um, as as you're, you're, you've got this upcycled book and just kind of playing off of that a little bit and playing into this week and, and the just the the stress that this week can bring when you're dealing with different personalities and different um, broken situations and trauma and all the things. Um, let's talk a little bit about how to go about this week in a healthy way, um, how to go at it with grace and, and just some, maybe some practical tips that you have so that we can just all get along. <laughs> I think that's brilliant because if you go into those holiday seasons with a plan on how to do it in a healthy way, it really helps you when you face the conflict and the uncomfortableness of being around people who might be a little bit less functional than ideal in your family relationships and spaces. So sometimes you will need to go into those spaces recognizing that there are people who don't respect boundaries well. And you're going to need to set those boundaries ahead of time and recognize where you need to say, I need to limit the amount of time I spend around this person who's very toxic in my life. So don't let someone else demand of you 
more time than you're willing to give where you can stay healthy in their in their company. So know if someone is always going to bring your mood down, who's going to dis- de-esteem you and disrespect you, someone that violates your boundaries, who is not a good listener, those kinds of people, when they are stepping over those boundaries and trying to make you responsible for their behavior, for example, or you responsible for their emotional well-being, those are people that you probably are going to need to set boundaries with and, and limit the amount of time that you spend with them during the holidays. So when you're going to stay at a relative's house, where can you go to get some time by yourself to pray, to process and to let go of some of the hurts and the things that happen in those spaces. And then another thing that you can do is learn to listen past what people say and how they say it on the surface. If you're listening to someone's heart for the vulnerable feeling that's under what they're expressing on the surface, then you can connect with them and it can kind of diffuse the angry, bitter, frustrated moment that's happening. So if you hear them expressing anger and frustration, you could reflectively listen and say, I hear you expressing anger and frustration. I wonder if maybe you're feeling disrespected or hurt or threatened or wounded. And I'm sorry that you're feeling that way. And that gives them a chance to respond whether or not you're seeing that correctly and correct you if they're not. But it also lets them know that you're hearing their heart, not just their behavior. So those are a couple of quick ways that you can diffuse some conflict, that you can keep yourself healthy emotionally. And when people are not respecting you, when they're not healthy around you, make sure that you take the extra time for self-care before and after and during those holiday seasons, meditating on scripture, praying and letting God heal your heart when someone has been emotionally vomiting on you, so to speak. That happens during the holidays a lot, especially if there's been grief or loss. People tend to respond with anger and they want to control what happened. They want to blame somebody for what happened. So just remembering that that's part of the anger process. And instead of letting that sink deep in, giving that burden over to God in prayer can really help you unburden some of those feelings that that other person is trying to make you responsible for. Yeah, that's so good, Tina. And, you know, what you said prior to that about just um, really listening to maybe what their heart is saying, you know, where their, their heart wound is coming from and to have that compassion, right? Instead of deflecting it or being prickly, you know, when they when they come out with uh, guns a-blazing kind of thing, uh, to just really have compassion and say, oh, okay, I get it. They're They're coming from this experience or this trauma or this place right now in this season. So I'm just going to love them anyway and give them grace. Right. And you may have to, um, like you said, go do some prayer meditation, but go for a walk. Sometimes you might just need to get out of the house and go for a walk. And that will help decompress as well. And, and shake off some of that, um, that nasty energy. But um, I think that is, is really um, great and profound and good practical steps. What about, um, Maybe when, you know, it's Thanksgiving time and um, you are, you really don't have control too much with, with the healthy boundaries because you are so in a close proximity, you know, uh, of space. Um, Yes, you can go out for the walk and that kind of thing. But what if, how, how do you show up? How do you just, do you have just a mindset shift and change your ways and how you show up in that time or how do you uh, deal with that if you are literally kind of trapped in, in a in a vacation home or a home or whatever with family members that you just aren't jiving and and uh, you're not jiving with? If you can't set physical boundaries, just remember to set emotional and spiritual boundaries, and remember that you don't have to take responsibility for the things that they're trying to make you responsible for. Sometimes people, especially if they come from a dysfunctional background and those that involve, for example, things like addictions in the background, 
the people who have been addicts or alcoholics want to shove all their personal responsibility on other people. And that's just one example. And that characterological issue can continue beyond the addiction, even if the addiction is gone. And that can be a learned behavior by people that are in the family as well. So those are some, that's just an example. But remembering you don't have to take responsibility for what someone gave you, but you don't necessarily have to fight with them about it. There you so go. make sure you choose your battles wisely and you can remain firm and say, I'd rather not discuss that right now. And if they ask you again, you say, I actually told you I'd rather not discuss that right now. Can we be respectful and, and continue on with dinner? Yeah. And, good. and just calmly don't Calm. take the emotional energy, right? Of the situation, allow the other person to have as much emotional energy as they want to but you don't take on their emotional responsibility. They will try to push it on you, but if you remain calm and if you remain firm in what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do, that's what set, setting boundaries is. Yeah, it'll it's not diffuse. killing people, right? right? It just, it sort of diffuses the opportunity for them to push you. Yeah. And that's yeah. kind of what they usually try to do if they're not willing to, or not able to in the, in the emotional state that they're in, accept or respect or recognize other people's boundaries. Yeah. That's so good. And I mentioned that not that every, uh, you know, Thanksgiving is going to be like throwing food across the table and there's going <laughs> to be some knockdown drag out or anything. No, cause there's a lot of wonderful, um, you know, activities and, and, and fun family time for, for most families, but there are those moments. So I just wanted to bring that up because it's good to have kind of an action step and be prepared ahead of time. Um, speaking of being prepared, um, we have a lot of children, uh, in our, in our family and, uh, they're getting older, but still a lot of, a lot of kids. And so sometimes I feel like they get, uh, or could get a little bored. And so I think that your craft, your upcycled, a uh, book is actually very timely because you could take some of those crafts and maybe even, you know, allow the kids to do something and it'll keep them busy and they'll be proud of what they did maybe before dinner, after dinner, whatever. And um, I think that's kind of a good idea. What do you think? I think there's a couple of crafts that kids could do. Most of them are geared toward adults, but okay. they could certainly make the home body to hug share out of paper and make it as a card that you could send to somebody. It's actually hands with inspirational messages attaching them to be like a hug. So oh, you could cute. make that out of paper and make it into a card that you send to somebody or that you donate to someone who's a shut-in or a child that might be in the hospital or something like that. And that's a wonderful way for kids to recognize that they are vessels of blessings too and they matter and the things that they do count. I love that. And especially on this um, you know, Thanksgiving week, um, that we're, we're giving, you know, and that's, that's a nice yeah. little craft to give to somebody else. And, and, um, yeah, that's beautiful. Um, you have worked a lot with people with ADHD and, and stress management and that kind of thing. Um, can we dive in a little bit to, um, maybe some practical tips of, I mean, cause I've done some podcasts on, on stress management, but I'm just curious from your perspective, um, stress management, how to deal with it, how to release that stress and, and come at it with a different um, attitude. Uh, what, what do you suggest for, for some of your patients? Well, there are quite a number of things, but the number one antidote to stress that has no side effects is laughter believe yeah, it or not. Yeah. And we bond with people through play. So one way during the holidays that you can reduce your stress is by connecting with people that you love through playtime and finding ways that you can laugh together more. Laughter changes your neurochemistry. It is an incredibly powerful anti-anxiety drug. So include some laughter. That's a really quick, easy, free way to reduce your stress. Another thing is is your expectations can sometimes create anxiety and we get high expectations over the holidays. So if you set your priorities as people over projects and over perfection, mm -hmm. then that can reduce your stress and anxiety right there. So that's really important to manage your thoughts, 
to manage what you're focused on. And remember that instead of what if thoughts, this is something I have done with lots and lots of clients, change your what if thoughts to even if then God statements. Mm, That's good. I love that. Even if, even if God, yeah, because I, I think you're right around the holiday time or whether it's a birthday or whatever, we tend to magnify and just create massive expectations. And when they're not, when they're not met, we're disappointed, we're frustrated, maybe uh, angry a bit, and uh, that can bring on a lot of stress. So that's a good word. I love that. Um, you have had your own story of, of going through a, a health journey, basically, um, mental, mental health on, on some levels, right? And then um, with how you saw yourself as far as body image and um, uh, eating disorder, that kind of thing. Let's kind of peel back the layer, if you don't mind. It's in your bio, so I figured you'd like to talk about it. Um, because I believe um, since you've had the breakthrough and you're way on the other side of that, that um, your story could bless somebody else here that's listening. I think it's a huge trigger during the holidays for those who have body image issues because there's so much food and so much pressure to eat food that isn't necessarily healthy when you go to family gatherings. And if you happen to have eating disorders or body image issues, all of that gets triggered right there. So remembering to see yourself the way God sees you and to bless your body with the things that you eat and change the way that you see eating and see food as a way to nourish the vessel that God is using to bless others. That is kind of what I have had to do with with recovering from eating disorder, which is a perfectionistic disorder, actually. And it's something that um, takes a long time. And it's something that is a recurring, ongoing, you have to battle against the enemy's attack of, you know, you're not good enough, you're not thin enough, and all of those things that that will constantly come up, you know, during certain times of year. And I think the holidays are one, and summer can sometimes be one when people are going into swimsuit season, that can be a trigger. But right now during the holidays, just ahead of time, go ahead and develop for yourself some scriptures. Psalm 139 is great. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And just think about how God loves you just intimately and how he created the food before you. That's God made food, whole food, that God created food is there to bless you and nourish your body. So seeing it that way, instead of, you know, in a dysfunctional way, either through overeating or starvation, whichever way you may be tempted to deal with that, that is something that can help you ahead of time is just changing the way you define nutrition, the way you define your body as a vessel not as something according to the world standards of what we're supposed to live up to with a model-like appearance or something like that. Just remembering that you're a vessel, you're supposed to be Jesus with skin on, and that's all that your skin is there for, is to convey the spirit of God into the spaces where he sends you. And if you could stay healthy enough to do that as well as you possibly can by the way you nourish your body, then that is God's will for you because he loves you and he wants what's best for you and what's best for others through you. Well, you're talking my language on that one. I love mm-hmm. that. Um, absolutely. And um, and I don't know if you want to go into your particular story on when that started for you and when and when that moment was that you fully overcame that. And I know you said there's still sometimes triggers, and that's pretty common. Um, if you don't, that's okay too. Um, but uh, it, we we can we can move on, but I just thought you know you've got it in your bio. It might be something we want to talk about because sure. it is a journey, and um, I think you know. But it was a long journey, and it actually yeah. started in middle school. And I think that can be a common place for that to start because that's when that developmental stage is of you deciding how you fit in with other people. And kids and are I had, very critical at that time yeah, too. Yeah, well, it wasn't even just that. It was, I was the weird nerdy kid that didn't really fit in very well with anyone. So I always felt like I wasn't really loved or accepted by other children. And I thought if I could just be so small, if I could just be thin, then maybe they would let me be in their space. Mm. So I 
saw it to be thinner and thinner and thinner. And again, it is a little bit of a perfectionist thing. It's something I can control. I can make myself thinner and thinner by refusing to eat and refusing to eat and refusing to eat. But it continued because of self-esteem issues of, of not feeling lovable and not feeling good enough. And it went on for eight years until wow. I was 20. And the thing that healed that, strangely enough, was that I became pregnant with my first child and that became a higher priority than being thin. And I began to focus more on my relationship with God and becoming the mom I needed to be and taking care of that baby. And as I was doing that, I was also newly married and I was trying to navigate all of those very difficult things when you're first married. And I realized as well that I could only get my esteem from God, not from how other people saw me, not from looking a certain way. I would never, ever be thin enough if I tried to be thin enough. I would never be enough in any other way, performance-wise, because that was another perfectionistic thing that I was falling into often. None of those things would ever give me the identity and esteem that I needed to feel fulfilled. Only God could do that. So I began that journey during my pregnancy with my first child, seeking God and seeking to get back into putting God as my first love, walking only with him and trusting only him for my source of identity and worth and approval. I, thank you for sharing, Tina, because I totally put you on the spot. And I know that what you just shared is going to bless the listeners. You just bless me by by hearing from from you because I, I I've known you for quite a while and I didn't know your story. So uh, it is amazing how um, you know everyone has a story, right? But the truth is, is that we just want to know that we're loved and we're accepted. And the truth is, is we are because of Jesus, right? Um, but it's receiving that and really knowing who we are in Christ. And so um, thank God for uh, you getting pregnant early on at age 20 and, uh, and God healing you and restoring you and uh, being able to, to share and, and help others now through, through your experience, because you've been there, you, you understand, and you probably have just incredible compassion. And yet, obviously, your, your license, you've been doing this a long time, 20 years, but you, you can understand what someone might be thinking that's in that similar place and whether it's not eating or eating too much. There's uh, a lot of my patients that are, you know, tend to eat more than, than not eat. Um, and so it's, it's the same kind of thing. It's really more of a, a, a spiritual and mindset, um, you know, uh, disconnect really. And so um, anyway, thank you for sharing. That's beautiful. Well, I want to go back to your book because it's, it's just newly released and um, I'm just so thrilled for you. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, just really the overall premise of the book. When I, like I said, when I dove in and I realized there was all this heart work and these questions, I thought, oh my goodness, this is fantastic. This would really help you know, people go through their journey and help them through the healing process, wherever they are. Uh, let's talk about kind of, you know, maybe why you really wanted to get this out there and, and who it's, who it's for, who did you write it for? Well, originally I was on a walk with the Lord in the park and it was right after a Christian product expo where I had met with some ministry leaders and retailers and what I was learning from all the people I was hearing from during that time was that even after the forced isolation ended, people were choosing to stay isolated because it had become comfortable and familiar and easier than interacting with messy other people. Right. And yet we're broken and we can only heal fully and use our gifts and be fulfilled fully in relationship with other people. So as I was walking with the Lord, I was kind of asking him, how can we fix this? You know, like, is there something I could do, something I could write, something I could provide that would give something for people to center on, to gather around and begin that process of reconnecting and also healing in who they are and then the cracks and the the chippy places of their souls where they just are worn and beaten down 
by the things that they've been through in the last few years. And the Lord kept showing me these images of these beautiful antiques that I see when I go out and go shopping because I love going to antique malls and seeing all those old things that have been repurposed and made new. And that I realized is what God does for us. He takes us when we're beaten down, worn, shabby, all of our finishes peeling off, and he restores our souls into something better than we could be before that, or even on our own strength after that. He makes us better than new. And this is what the projects will show us as we're reading through the passages and learning about restoration and renewal in our souls, our hearts, and our minds. We can also do a project, which is that next level of deepening that learning and growth experience. And then there are suggestions about places you can donate those crafts if you want to. And then paying it forward is yet another step of fulfilling that process of the blessing of learning and growth and fulfillment. Yeah, I loved that piece as well, that you had the, the ministry outreach opportunities. And that was something new that I hadn't really seen in other books before or, or the crafts for that matter. Um, so I love that, especially in this week of Thanksgiving. It's it's about give, you know, giving to others, uh, showing up in a different way, having gratitude and having thanks and how that changes our health as well when we are giving back, right? Uh, so not only doing your own heart work and then doing it in a in a you know, craft and, but also giving that away with love. Uh, it really blesses somebody else and, and helps in our healing. So um, what would you say is um, maybe some of the, you know, some of your patients that you've worked with in the past, maybe um, I'm going to go back to, uh, cause you, you specialize in ADHD, stress management and several other things, but uh, since ADHD is on the, on the first part of that uh, sentence, let's talk about ADHD because I'm, you know, I'm not going to put titles on me at all. My son puts it on me, but I will not take it. Um, but some of us are a little more creative and have a lot of um, uh, thoughts going on at several times at the same time. Um, so what would you say to somebody that might be dealing with somebody that is a little more creative and on the ADHD side of things? Um, when it, when it comes to just communication and, and to help spark and, um, I guess, solidify a stronger relationship when you're dealing with someone that might be a little more bouncy. Well, not like every that? ADHD bouncy. bouncy. <laughs> I love that. And, and I also want people who happen to have ADHD to realize that it's not just a disorder, it's a different way of being wired. So it can actually be helpful in a lot of things because you're able to hear and attend to multiple things all at the same time. Whereas the average person has to focus on pretty much one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And they can tune out things, whereas someone with ADHD has a trouble tuning things out. It says it's attention deficit, but it's really attention overload is what's going on in the mind of someone who is ADHD. So when you're working with someone, whether it's your child or someone that you love, just remember to only give them one or two things at a time. Because if you give them too many things, you will lose them between thing two and three or thing three and five, you'll lose them. If they'll, like if you tell your child that has ADHD five things to do, they might do the first one. Yeah. And then, and then the, the rest, you then forget already. to do the rest. <laughs> So just yeah. know that there are certain things that are more helpful when you're working with someone who is wired differently and it's okay to be wired differently. Jesus knew that about Simon before he built the church on Simon. There Simon Peter go. was just as ADHD <laughs> as anybody you'll see in your life today, but God wasn't surprised about that. He knew that already. And yet he knew, you know, a church leader, wow, you're going to be able to attend to everything all at the same time. You will not miss a thing. And that's actually pretty helpful for someone to be able to multitask and be bouncy as you, as you described it. I love that. And it <laughs> helps that, that process of being able to be the leader who can be in charge of all kinds of different things all at the same time. And I, I just think that it can be helpful. If you look at people like Winston Churchill, 
who was certainly ADHD or, you know, Ted Turner, or there's lots of people who are extremely successful and brilliant because of the way that they are wired, not just in spite of it. So remembering to value the good things about that and not just see it as something that's a disorder. And also remember your communication style needs to be shifted a little bit. If you talk too long, use too many words, you will lose them and they won't hear you. So yes. short size, and everything. Twitter, yes. Twitter, uh, <laughs> Twitter yes. sentences. <laughs> yes. No, that's so good. Well, um, as we wrap up this podcast, I'm just curious, um, what's something fun that maybe people don't know about you, Tina? Maybe you have a, a special, uh, a certain hobby that you like to do beyond crafting and antiquing, but maybe there's something, a, a talent or a skill or, or something you'd like to share that would be kind of fun for our audience. I do have a hobby of waterfall hunting. I, I have Ooh. moved to North Carolina two years ago, and I so love going out when I get a chance to the mountains and looking for a waterfall. There's something worshipful and renewing and restorative about getting out in creation and recognizing God's handiwork right there all around you. And it's just beautiful. And I love that so much. And it's just, there's something healing about getting outside and doing a little exercise and getting some fresh air. So I do love that. That's one of my hobbies. I love that one. That one sounds like right up my alley. Um, Have you ever been behind a waterfall? I have. There is one in North Carolina that you can walk behind. I went with my son and did a hike out there and we got to get behind the waterfall. Oh, that was that really cool. Is, that is the best. Well, I love that, that you are a waterfall chaser. There's storm chasers and then there's waterfall chasers and that's Tina. So thank you for, for sharing your, uh, your love of people and your love of getting people um, into a place where they can really hear God's love and how it literally is a waterfall, a cascade of love mm-hmm. Uh, once they really know who they are in Christ. And so uh, your work with Upcycled allows for people to do that heart work so that they can feel that cascade uh, of God's love. So thank you for doing the work there. Can people get your book at tinayeager.com or what's the best place? There are links to the book at tinayeager.com. There's also craft videos. So if you're doing this with a group or alone and you want to see how it's done, you can watch me do it. So it kind of helps you visualize it a little bit better. Sometimes that's better Definitely. than just step-by-step. Step. Yes, I need and then the visual. If, if you want a free downloadable upcycled inspirational weekly flip book template, you can go to upcycledbook.com and you can get that. You can make an upcycled flip book out of recycled greeting cards. So that's something you could do with your kids for the holidays to give to teachers or pastors or friends or neighbors. Brilliant. And so that's upcycled flipbook, upcycledbook.com, upcycledbook.com. Okay. All that will be in the show notes. So y'all can catch it there, but thank you, Tina, so much for your time. Mm -hmm. Bless you. And uh, we will catch you all next time on visibly fit. Thanks for tuning in. Well, that's a wrap for today's show. So thank you so much for tuning in. I love spending this time with you. To learn more and get more free resources, just head on over to wendypet.com. And thank you in advance for sharing this episode and this podcast, following and subscribing not only to this podcast, but finding me on social media, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you are, I'm probably there too. Until next week in our next podcast time together, make it a visibly fit day.